Hello friends and welcome to our broadcast. This is Limitless Life. My name is Larry Hutton and Merry Christmas week, everyone. Woo I love this time of year. Merry, Merry Christmas. We're gonna take a break actually this week from our regular teaching and we are gonna have some fun this week. I'm telling you, we're just gonna have a blast because I'm, I'm gonna spend all five days talking about Christmas. And we're gonna talk about the supernatural side of Christmas. You know, all the things that surround Christmas. What does the scriptures have to say? But we're also gonna talk about a lot of natural things about Christmas. I'm, in fact, I'm gonna even talk to you about Santa Claus. <laughs> Think about that. I can just hear someone say, oh, Brother Larry, Santa Claus, that's ungodly. We should not be talking about Santa Claus. And I can hear other people saying, besides that, we should not even celebrate Christmas because it has its roots in pagan practices. Well then, let's talk about all of it. <laughs> let's discuss the history of Christmas. Let's discuss the many traditions of Christmas. But let's have fun, man. Let's be open to the Word of God and what it teaches us and even the natural things of Christmas. What about uh, Christmas trees and Christmas lights and Christmas decorations and Christmas parties and what about the giving of gifts? Let's talk about all that. There's nothing wrong with discussing these things, especially when you see what Scripture has to say. I believe by the end of this week, you'll find you have a much greater understanding of why we should celebrate Christmas and how to use this Christmas season to glorify God. But let's have fun doing it. Let's, let's just start today on a real light note. Let's talk about Santa Claus. <laughs> yep, I'm going to talk about good old jolly Saint Nick because the character uh, who we call Santa Claus actually came from a real person. Um, depending on what part of the world you have come from or maybe you're listening from, there are a lot of different names that have been associated with Santa Claus. I wrote down some of them, Santa Claus, Saint Nick, Kris Kringle, Father Christmas over in Great Britain, uh, Pierre Noel in France, uh, Sinterklaas in, in, from the Dutch, uh, Grandfather Frost from Russia, and then Christkind or um, Christ child from the Germans. So let's talk about how all of this started. Where did we get to Santa Claus? Where did it start from? Well, it all started from a real man by the name of Saint Nicholas. So the question becomes, uh, all right, so how did Saint Nicholas become this plump, jolly, red-cheeked, white-bearded, grandfatherly figure in a big red suit who brought gifts to children in a big sleigh pulled by, by eight reindeer who lived in the North Pole. <laughs> how, how did that all happen? Well, actually, the original Saint Nicholas was a Greek. He was born in the late third century, around 280 AD. He was born on the Mediterranean coast in a seaport city called Patera. That's in Asia Minor. We know it today as modern-day Turkey. Nicholas was born to a wealthy Christian family. I sh shouldn't say family. I should say wealthy Christian parents because he was an only child. Um, and when I saw that, uh, the time he was born in Impetera, I thought, you know, it's possible because you find out his parents were actually Christian. It's pro possible and, and even probable that we could trace his parents' spiritual heritage back to the Apostle Paul. And that is because the Apostle Paul had stopped in Patera on his third missionary journey about 200 years prior to his birth. Anyway, so his parents were devout believers. Uh, they had prayed to God for a child, and so when Nicholas was born, they dedicated him to God. And as their only child, they raised him with a lot of affection and a, spent a lot of time with him. They had great hopes for Nicholas uh, because he was their only son. In fact, they named him Nicholas, uh, which means the, the name of the, the definition of Nicholas means hero of the people. I thought that was interesting. And really, I thought it was real interesting because calling him something godly and hero of the people, that was during the time 
when the Roman Empire was dominant and Christianity was illegal. But that still didn't change his parents from raising him according to Christian standards and godly standards. So Nicholas was raised as a very kind and a very generous kid. He always shared his meals with the less fortunate and was always looking to lend a helping hand. His demeanor and his outlook on life made him a friend to all. I mean, young and old alike, people just liked to be around him. He just brought joy everywhere he went. And then uh, at a very young age, as a young boy, he joined the church and the church gave him task. I thought this was interesting to help people. So he was just a helper already. They saw that. And so that was a grace upon his life. And so as he continued to grow into his teenage years, he just had this special grace from God towards children. And he was always giving children special attention. Uh, his playful and joyful manner made all the kids of the village very fond of him. There is a sad part of the story when you read about the history of St. Nicholas, and that is when he was just a teenager, uh, a plague came in uh, to the area and struck the town that he was living in, and both of his parents died. So that was sad, but the good news is that they, those parents had put enough word of God into Nicholas that even though uh, the, the, he experienced the tragic death of, of his parents, it did not deter his walk from the Lord. In fact, even before their death, he had already told them he wanted to be a priest, so he had set his eyes on becoming a priest. And then another positive uh, was that his parents, being very wealthy, left him a fortune. So he ended up using his inheritance to honor God. I mean, he used it to assist the suffering, uh, to assist the sick, to give to the poor. Uh, that was just his heart. So Nicholas, anyway, after their death, he continued his priestly studies and developed such a good reputation in his region that by the time he was in his early 20s, uh, he was actually chosen as Archbishop of Mira, which was just a, a little town southeast of Patera. And uh, so he was a very young priest, you know, in his early 20s. In fact, they called him the boy bishop. That's what he became known as. But from that time on, man, he just continued to walk with God, although his life wasn't always easy. Um, he actually spent, right after uh, becoming a priest, he actually spent five years in prison because of his Christian faith. Uh, you remember uh, the Roman emperor, emperor he, um, he banned Christianity, uh, but he was overthrown while, uh, while um, Nicholas was in prison and then eventually replaced by Constantine. If you've done study of history, Constantine was the first uh, Christian emperor. And so when he became emperor, Nicholas got released from hit prison, but he also uh, was allowed publicly to teach the Christian faith. During Nicholas's lifetime, he became well known for defending his people against imperial taxes and all other forms of oppression. Uh, he was always a very kind man, uh, had a reputation of giving gifts anonymously, where he gave gifts but didn't want people to know it was him doing it. When he traveled, this is an interesting fact about uh, Nicholas. When he traveled, he traveled on horseback. Of course, people would have known that. There weren't cars or anything at the time, right? But he traveled on horseback, but he always wore a long red robe uh, with a red hat. In fact, people knew him so much in that attire that as he went from village to village, the kids would see from afar and see that bright red robe coming and they would all gather together to greet him as he passed by. <laughs> One of my favorite stories about St. Nicholas is when he helped a struggling father and his three daughters. Uh, the story goes that the father had fallen into hard times and was unable to provide dowries for his three daughters, who were now at the age uh, where they could get married. In those days, if a young lady was going to marry, her family had to have a dowry, which was either property or uh, money, that they could offer the prospective bridegroom. Uh, the larger the dowry, the better chance she would have of getting a good husband. <laughs> the sad part about the way that, that worked was a, uh, without a dowry, a 
young lady was even unlikely to get married. And so this poor father in this story, he was worried that his daughter, daughters would be sold into slavery or perhaps something even worse. Anyway, as the story goes, word of this family situation where this poor father couldn't provide dowries for his daughters, word got back to St. Nicholas and because he was very wealthy with his parents' inheritance, um, he decided he was gonna help out. So one night, here's how the story goes. One night when all the town, they were all in bed asleep and lights were out, Nicholas uh, secretly snuck over to their house and tossed a bag of gold into the house for one of the daughters. And I've, I've read different accounts. It was very interesting when I was studying this. I've read different accounts and some say he threw that bag of gold through the window. Others say that he couldn't find a way to get in so he snuck up on the rooftop and he threw down the bag of gold down the chimney. In fact, one account I was reading after actually said that the, that the bag of gold landed in the stocking that was hand, handed, uh, hanging on the chimney. I kind of like that, that account right there. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> anyway, St. Nicholas did that, not just the one time, but on three different occasions, he snuck to that house because he wanted all three daughters to have dowries so they could get married. And as the story goes, the father actually caught St. Nicholas the third time he came to the house to throw in the uh, bag of gold. He actually caught St. Nicholas and he told St. Nicholas that you have certainly saved my family from certain disaster. St. Nicholas did not want um, any of the glory because remember I told you he was known for giving anonymously. So he actually begged the man to uh, conceal his identity to keep it secret until after St. Nicholas died. And so he just told the man, he said, listen, give God the thanks, give God all the praise for what was done. That shows you the heart, the type of man that St. Nicholas was. For all his good deeds, Bishop Nicholas was named a saint. Uh, even had a date named after him. December 6th became St. Nicholas Day. And uh, that was to honor the saint who had looked at it. And when they made it that day, they said it was a date to honor the saint who looked after children. And uh, so from that time on, people all over the world began to celebrate St. Nicholas. They would hang stockings on the fire place uh, the night before and then the next morning they would find stockings filled with candy and fruit or nuts or toys. In fact, according to records, St. Nicholas died on December 6th, which was the day that they called St. Nicholas Day, but he died in, 13, um, in 343 AD. And of course, we all know that his legacy lived on. The first Europeans that arrived in the New World brought their stories with them about St. Nicholas. Uh, the Vikings dedicated uh, a cathedral in Greenland to him. Uh, on December 6, 1492, when Christopher Columbus stopped in Haiti, he actually named a port St. Nicholas. So that's pretty interesting. In fact, here's a fun fact. Me being from Florida, I like this one. I was born and raised in Florida. But when the uh, Spaniards... Uh, first began settling in Florida, they named one of their early settlements St. Nicholas Ferry, which uh, has become known today as Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. So St. Nicholas became a legend. Of course, some of his stories were true and other stories were fabricated and became folklore. Uh, in North America, for example, the name St. Santa Claus originated from the Dutch people with a contracted form of St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, uh, which mor morphed into Center Claus in the Dutch culture. So Center Claus was brought to America back in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and then in 1773, a New York City newspaper referenced his name for the very first time as Santa Claus. So that actually took place in 1773. But the image that you and I are familiar with today, the one that uh, became popular, didn't happen until the 19th century. Um, and there was really what, was, what greatly influ influenced the image we see today was a uh, cartoonist, uh, a caricaturist, uh, back in 1823, you might have heard of him. His name is uh, Thomas Nast. 
and he drew this picture um, of Santa Claus and uh, and then uh, oh yeah in fact he had a poem he wrote a poem it may have been, I think maybe the it was there were arguments when I was reading history I think there were arguments of who the actual author of the poem was um, Thomas Nash made it famous but I think it was either uh, Henry Livingston or uh, Clement Clark Moore that actually wrote the poem but uh, anyway this was a poem that made Saint Santa Claus famous any guesses as to what that poem is well it was titled a visit from Saint Nicholas and became known as Twas the Night Before Christmas and all through the house. <laughs> but it was, it was this image put forth by Thomas Nast in 1823 that thrust Santa's modern image into the minds and hearts of people. And then, of course, song and radio and television came along and children's books and films and advertising uh, the image of Santa and his reindeer just became bigger than life uh, and then the final cog if you will of Santa's legend came in the 1930s when a coca-cola illustrator uh, by the name of Haddon Sunbaum I think is how you pronounce his name but um, he changed Santa's colors because originally the Santa, all the center claws and all those weren't red and, and white like we see them today. But in this uh, Coca-Cola ad, this illustrator showed Santa in a red suit. So he was red suited Santa with white fur trim and black leather boots. And of course, that became the icon iconic standard recognizable today. Now, I I'll admit there's a lot of controversy among Christians about Santa Claus. That's why I'm trying to point out the very roots of where it came from. But when people talk about Santa Claus, they say, well, that takes away the focus from the real reason for the season, and that is Jesus. Other people would say, well, parents shouldn't lie to their kids about someone who is not real. And still others will say, well, you know, that's, that's just all part of the commercialized holiday and a symbol of the consumerism that has swallowed up the true meaning of Christmas. And, you know, that's, that's true. I believe all those things. Uh, however, beneath all the symbolism and, and all the traditions that have been attached to Santa Claus, remember, he can be traced back to a humble Christian bishop who loved God and showed God's love to others. Saint Nicholas showed the love of God through his words, through his actions, his deed, through his giving, just like God showed us his love when he gave his only begotten son. The modern day Santa Claus is indeed associated with illusions and imaginations, but the beauty of our American Santa Claus is that his roots came from a real person who was, listen to this, a servant of Jesus Christ, not a competitor. I'm going to say that again. Santa Claus came from St. Nicholas, who was a servant of Jesus Christ, not a competitor. Listen, listen, I'll be honest. I grew up, I don't know how many of you did, but I grew up believing in Santa Claus, and it did not seem to dwarf my walk with God. <laughs> all my memories of Santa Claus and the fantasies and the magic of Christmas, all of my memories are good. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm in complete agreement with those who say that our total focus ought to be on Jesus and on heaven and our heavenly Father during the Christmas season. I'm totally agreeing with that, but I don't think it's necessary to shield our kids from books that have pictures of Santa Claus and throw away all the Christmas ornaments that you have on your tree that have Santa on them and anything else associated with them. In fact, I think you ought to show your kids that you know how to pretend you do it with a, with a daughter or a son when, when you're pretending with them as being a princess and a king or being this great little ball player or whatever you're pretending with your son. So learn how to play with Santa Claus. Learn how to teach uh, about this imaginary man who, who came from a real man 
And, you know, because we're surrounded with songs and images of Santa during the Christmas season, you'll have plenty of opportunities. So just pick an opportunity and share the true story of St. Nick with your kids and with the people and just make it fun and, and, you know, happy. Tell the story as an inspiration that we need to serve God and love God and help others just like St. Nicholas did. Amen. You know, when you read about the real St. Nick, there's no doubt that he knew the real reason for the season. So for St. Nicholas, it was all about Jesus. Therefore, in honor of St. Nicholas, and more importantly, in honor of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, I'm going to spend the next couple minutes, in fact, I'm going to have to do this real quick, I'm going to go through the 66 books of the Bible and show you Jesus. Genesis, he's the creator, he's the redeemer, he's the seed of the woman. Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. Leviticus, he's the high priest in the atoning sacrifice. Numbers, he's the smitten rock, the water in the desert, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses and the one who was cursed for us. Joshua, he's the commander of the army of the Lord and the commander of our salvation. Judges, he's the judge, the lawgiver, and the deliverer. Ruth, he's our heavenly kinsman and redeemer. First Samuel, he's the prophet, the priest, and the king. Second Samuel, Samuel, he's the king of grace and love. First Kings, he's the ruler greater than Solomon. Second Kings, he's a powerful prophet. First Chronicle, he's the son of David. Second Chronicles, he's the king who reigns eternally. Ezra, he's the faithful scribe and priest proclaiming freedom. Nehemiah, he's the restorer and rebuilder of what is broken. Esther, he's the advocate and like Mordecai, the protector of his people. Job, he's the mediator between God and man. He's our ever living redeemer and he's our all in all. Psalms, he's our Lord, our king, our maker, our savior, our righteousness, our song, our shepherd, our light, our hiding place, our shelter, our strong tower, our our rock, our fortress, our redeemer, our deliverer, our strength, our shield, our protector, our guide, our defense, the lifter of our heads, the father of the fatherless, a defender of widows. He's the most high, the almighty one, the king of glory, the holy one of Israel, a very present help in times of trouble and our portion in the land of the living. Wow. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom, our creator, our governor of the universe, our healer, our life, our financier, and the pattern for our lives. In Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning for life and our goal of life. In Song of Solomon, he's the satisfier, the author of faithful love and our bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant, the redeemer, the healer, the miracle worker, the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the weeping Messiah and the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet and the the one who takes God's wrath from us. In Ezekiel, he's the son of man. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fire. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost. In Amos, he's the burden barrier, a burden bearer and the deliverer of the justice to the oppressed. Um, deliver of justice to the oppressed. Obadiah, he's the judge of the evil and mighty to save. In Jonah, he's the great missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he's the crusher of injustice. In Zephaniah, he's the warrior who saves. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's the foundation of cleansing for our sins. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness, the healer. And in Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, he's the servant uh, and the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man and the deliverer. In John, he's the son of God and God in the flesh. In Acts, he's the risen Christ and the spirit that dwells in people. In Romans, he's our justifier and our righteousness. In 1 Corinthians, he's the power of God and the love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he's our sanctifier, the down payment for our future inheritance. In Galatians, he's our redeemer and very life. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches and the unifier of the church. In Philippians, he's the provider and the joy of our life. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead, the supreme of all things. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, he's the comfort of the last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In 1 Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man. In 2 Timothy, he's the righteous judge. In Titus, he's the foundation of truth. In Philemon, he's our warden and our friend of the oppressed. In Hebrews, he's our high priest, ratifier, and sacrifice of the everlasting covenant and the source of our faith. In James, he's our perfect law of liberty, the lawgiver, and the great physician. In 1 Peter, he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the incorruptible seed, the word of God, the chief cornerstone, our sin bearer, our sickness bearer, our shepherd, our bishop of our lives, the ark of our salvation and hope in times of suffering. 
In 2 Peter, he's the day star and the deliverer from temptation. In 1 John, he's the word of life, the payment for our sins, the destroyer of Satan's works, and the love of God and the giver of life. In 2 John, he's God in the flesh. In 3 John, he's the source of truth, the source of prosperity, and the source of health. In Jude, he's the preserver of saints and the one who keeps us from falling. In Revelation, he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first love, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God, the one who will make all things new. He is is faithful. He is true. He is called the Word of God in His bright and morning star. Ooh, I'll have to take up later in the week and go back over some of those. That is just powerful. Hey, I wanted to mention real quick as we're running out of time, we have three instrumentals and I'll mention more about them in the next program, but they don't, there's no talking or preaching or anything. They're just instrumentals from world-class keyboard player from different parts of the country, three different keyboards that just bring an atmosphere of peace into your home, into your car, into your office, wherever you play these. You can download these off the website or you can order the CDs, Peace Be Still, Perfect Peace, and Great Peace. Three instrumentals that'll set an atmosphere of peace wherever you're at. I encourage you to get them. Well, we're out of time. We'll pick up your next program. Have a Jesus-filled day. Merry Christmas. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to larryhutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call 1-888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton, where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org, or you can call 888-887-WORD.